I'll try not to be 55 minutes tonight. <clears throat> I always say that and I never succeed, but uh, you'll notice if you haven't already looked, we have a model of the tabernacle and we'll be using that over the next weeks. Uh, give you at least an idea of how it's set up. And uh, a little ark of the covenant there that you can see. Inside the ark there you will see a miniature rod of Aaron's that budded. You'll see a pot of manna and you'll see the tablets of the law. And what's even more surprising when we open the cover on the Holy of Holies back there, you'll even see a little ark there and it has the same three things in it too. And that's a little bitty ark. But uh, sometimes just being able to see kind of helps you as you go through these things. Also, I handed out uh, some pictures that uh, kind of help you as we go through these. We won't get off through all these tonight, but if you hold on to those, it'll maybe help you as we go through that you can get an image uh, in your mind as we do look at these things. Oh, I forgot. I'll have to read this. Remind me to read this Sunday morning. All right, chapter 25 of Exodus. Now, from chapter 25 to chapter 30, God gives Israel a blueprint for the tabernacle and a blueprint for the pattern of the garments of the high priest, and he is very specific. Later, when they build the temple, it's very specific too. It always amazes me I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but in the temple, God says, I want you to put some flowers. And he puts them in the place that no one can see them, but he has it there for a purpose. Just in the tabernacle, everything has a purpose. So we're going to have the construction, the erection of the tabernacle, and the fact that it was filled with the glory of the Lord. We're going to discuss that. And the tabernacle was to be the center of Israel's life. There, because that is the place where man could approach God. You've probably seen the pictures, and I'll probably get you some. When Israel begins to camp with the tabernacle, they camp with three tribes on each side, with the center of the entire nation being the tabernacle. So 25, beginning verse 1 and 2, says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. I like this verse. I really do. You know, Israel had been in, out of slavery now only a few months. It's really still fresh in their minds. There's a new life they've started now. Yet the Lord says, I want you to help build my tabernacle. Notice carefully what God says here. This is so important. Of every man that giveth willingly with his heart, he shall take my offering. I think that's important because God says he wants the gifts to come from a right heart. You know, that hasn't changed today. He still wants your gift to come from the heart. He doesn't want it to come out of obligation. You know, when you get under, to a look under the law a little later, people went through the motions of the law as an obligation, but it, they weren't doing it with their heart. They would bring sacrifices because they were required to. But God didn't want it to be required. He wanted them to do it with the right heart. Just like today, the Lord doesn't want you to be forced to give an offering to the church. He wants you to give because you love Him. Notice, ye shall take of my offering of a willful heart. I don't want, the, I don't want anything else. And God can use that no. God doesn't stand on the medium strip at the intersection of a road or a stoplight and hold up a sign that says, give to me. He doesn't do that. He doesn't beg you to give. You ever notice that? He doesn't do that. He wants people to give with willing hearts, devotion, and want to trust Him. God wants us to know that when we give, because we trust Him, we love Him, we have faith in Him, that we cannot outgive Him. Now, if you're doing it out of obligation, or you're doing it because you think that the more I give, the more He's going to return, you're not going to get anything. But you cannot, with the right heart, you can't outgive God. It's a matter of faith. And the amazing thing here about the children of Israel, 
they brought so much that Moses had to start turning them away. That's, that's the right heart, isn't it? I can tell you for a fact, this is something that doesn't happen very often. I've never been in a church where I told the people, we, we, you're giving too much, don't give any more. It would be a good problem to have, but I've never run into that yet, and I don't doubt if any other of my pastor friends either. But Moses had to restrain them. Now, here are the items that they were to bring, beginning at verse 3. And this is the offering which he shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood, oil for the lamp, spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense, oxy stones and stones to be set in the ephod of the breastplate. We'll talk about that a little later. The first question that most people ask when they read this section is, where did this group of former slaves get all of this? You know, if they ask me that, I know one thing for sure. They haven't been reading and studying just this book of Exodus. If they had, they would have known where it came from. Remember when Israel was delivered out of slavery in Egypt? The people just came and gave them everything. 400 years of back pay, if you like to look at it that way. But they gave them everything that God specified here. They gave it to them. They didn't have to ask. They didn't have to go borrow. They just piled it onto them. Here's Exodus 12, 36 reminds us, the Lord gave people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them such things as required. And they spoiled the Egyptians. They took so much out of Egypt with them that they built the tabernacle. They left Egypt with a tremendous wealth. Everything they needed to build the tabernacle, all the things they needed for the furnishings of the tabernacle, even the things that they needed for the priestly garments, the high priest garments, and more. It's estimated that it took roughly $5 million worth of material and probably more by today's standard to construct the tabernacle. And some people get a little shocked at that, but when you start to look at all the gold and silver that's used, it's not too surprising. The tabernacle, though, was small in size, and there's a reason for that. It had to be carried in the wilderness. It, had to be, it was ornate, it was rich, it was beautiful, but it had to be able to be set up easily and taken down and carried easily. Verse 8 says, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. This is an important verse for us too. God never said He was going to live in the tabernacle. I've heard a lot of people say, Well, God lived and He dwelt there in the sense that He didn't live there in the sense that He was restricted to that one spot. You know, some people think that God just pushed himself into that little holy of holies and that's where he stayed all the time. His presence was there, but then again, his presence was a million other places too, wasn't it? He did not restrict himself to that one spot. He did say, however, that he would dwell between the cherubims. Now, we haven't got to the ark yet, but if you can see the little ark up here on the table, you'll see the two cherubim, the two angels with their wings spread, making a canopy. That's where God said He would dwell. Right there on the mercy seat. You'll find that uh, 1 Samuel 4, 4, 2 Samuel 6, 2, 2 Kings 9, 15, and Isaiah 37, 6 all give testimony to the fact that's what God said, that He would dwell between the cherubims. Israel was a theocracy. That is, ruled by God. God was their king. What a perfect situation. What a perfect way to live, isn't it? In a theocracy. God telling you what needs to be done. God guiding you, directing you. Israel was to be ruled by God. And that's a perfect situation. Except for one problem. Man has a sin nature. 
and rebels against God. And God's throne was between the cherubim. See, that's where man met God. You know, the idea exists today that God dwells in a building made by hands. And that's actually, you know, that is a pagan notion. They built shrines and their God would live there. Our God doesn't live in a building. Some people call the building God's house. We call it the house of the Lord. But we understand that it's not God's house in the sense that He is living here, but it is His. He owns it. He doesn't dwell in this building. He never did, but He's here. Solomon, I think, expressed it pretty well over in 1 Kings 8.27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have built it. Now, of course, that's uh, Solomon talking about the temple, which was far greater in size. But he says, heaven can't hold you. How can we build a house, any place to hold you here on earth? And the tabernacle was a place where man was to meet with God. Psalm 99.1 says, the Lord reigneth. Let the people tremble. He that setteth between the cherubims, let the earth be moved. The ark was God's throne. And it was the first article of furniture that they were to build. Now, don't ask me where the ark is today. Because I do not know. But I will tell you this. If we needed to know, God would show us. It's not important. Whether they... Jews hid it when the Babylonians came, whether the Babylonians took it, whether the Ethiopians have it in the church down there that I've heard all these, we don't know. And I'll tell you who doesn't have it, and that's Indiana Jones. We don't know where it is. If the time comes that we do need it, it will be here. Now, verse 9 says, According to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so... You may, if you, shall you make it. Now over in the book of Hebrews, it tells us that the earthly tabernacle is patterned after the tabernacle in heaven. The question is, is there a literal tabernacle in heaven? Well, I take the position that it is because God says it is. Not because I'm so smart or I had a vision, but God says so. I take uh, this literally and I feel that God meant something else. He would have said something else. You know, God's pretty straightforward. When you go through the book, the Bible, He's straightforward. He doesn't say that, well, y'all are not really sinners. He said, you're a sinner and you need to go to hell. You need somebody to save you. He doesn't mince words. And so when He says it's patterned after heaven, it's there. Hebrews 8.5 says, Who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God, when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern show to thee in the mount. Moses, I'm showing you the pattern of the tabernacle in heaven. This is what I want you to build. Pretty straightforward. Hebrews 9, 23 and 24 go on to say, It was ne therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into a holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So yes, I believe it's there. I tell you, I believe there's the Ark of the Covenant there. Everything that we see in the tabernacle, it's there somewhere. And one day we'll find out if I'm right or wrong. Now we're going to get instructions for the constructing of the Ark of the Covenant. There's something that really gets my attention. If I were going to describe the tabernacle, and maybe you too, if I look at the tabernacle, I would probably say, well, you've got a fence all the way around it with a gate opening to the east. And as you go in, you see the altar where blood ran 24 hours a day and then the 
uh, raise the, the, the labor there with a ceremonial washing and then you went into the holy place and you saw the showbread and you saw the candlestick and you see the altar of incense and then you open the curtain and you go into the holy of holies and there's the ark of the covenant. That's the way I would describe it. God doesn't do that. Do you notice? He starts in the enter. He starts where we would end. He starts at the beginning. The ark. He talks about the ark of the covenant. You know, it's, it's the enclosed place. You know, the tabernacle proper is 100 cubits long, 50 cubits wide. Cubic is from your elbow to the tip of your middle finger. About 18 inches. But, you know, you might have an architect who's a little longer fingered. So that's just, could be 18, could be 19, could be 17. 18 is the general accepted term. So if you measure yours, it could be longer or shorter than that. But the, uh, like I said, it vary, but it's about 18 inches. So if you consider the floor plan of the tabernacle, you will see that the outer court where the brazen altar and the laver are, that's outside of the tabernacle proper. And the tabernacle proper is divided in two compartments, the holy place and the holy of holies. The tabernacle itself was 30 cubics by 10 cubics by 10 cubits high, which means it was 45 feet long, 15 feet wide, 15 feet high. The holy place was 20 by 10 cubits, 30 feet by 15 feet. You know, I think in our mind we get the idea it's a huge place, but it's not. That's one of the things where we, we went to the, as I mentioned, the ark up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It's built to scale. And as you, you go into the outer court and you look at you're kind of surprised how small it is. And then when you go into the sanctuary itself, into the tabernacle, it looks a little big, but it's small. And then the Holy of Holies, as you peek through the window, it's really small and the ark is small compared to what we have in our mind. So the Holy of Holies was 10 cubics by 10 cubics by 10 cubics. It was a perfect cube, 15 feet square. Not very big. So the furniture of the holy place, of course, was the table of the showbread, the uh, candlestick, and the altar of incense. And the Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat were. Now we look at the Ark of the Covenant and we think it's one piece of furniture. But the mercy seat is actually separate from the Ark itself. Actually, it's looked at as two pieces of furniture. Uh, and just the two on the outside, the uh, altar and the labor. And, of course, there's in the white fence that goes around it. I like that we'll talk about the white fence later, but it always comes to mind that there's only one way in. Only one door. You have to come in that one door. You go into the tabernacle, there's just one door. You go through the Holy of Holies, there's just one way. You can't miss the image of Jesus Christ. One way. All right, stay, stay with your notes. We'll be here forever. Verse 10 says, And they shall make an ark of shittim wood, two cubits and a half shall the length be thereof, and a cubic and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubic and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold within and without, shall thou overlay it and shall make it a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof, and two rings shall be in one side of it, two rings in the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. The ark and the mercy seat above it was the place where God would meet the children of Israel. We'll find out that he met the children of Israel, though, by the high priest who could only go in there once a year on the Day of Atonement and sprinkle blood for his sin and for the sin of the nation. We'll talk more detail there, but that's how they approached. They had to approach through one man. So it's, uh, it's the most holy place of the tabernacle. And we want to notice that first, our first piece of furniture is the ark. It's most important. And again, as I said before, we're approaching it from God's viewpoint. We're looking from the inside out. 
Which is the way God looks at us, by the way. He looks at the inside, not the out. He's no respecter of persons. I mean, he, he doesn't look and say, boy, isn't she pretty? He looks at the heart and says, she's a sinner. That's the way God, from the inside out. And that's important for us to remember. So this is God's viewpoint. And the ark was in the Holy of Holies where God's presence would dwell for Israel. We're approaching it from man's viewpoint, as I said, we would start, I would start at the outside and describe it on the way in. But it was put together in a way that it was, as I said, easy to take down, easy to put up and transport. Each piece of furniture in the tabernacle was equipped with rings and staves so that it could be carried in the wilderness much easier. And of course, with the Ark of the Covenant, we'll find out they better not touch it. Even if it's getting ready to fall, you better not reach up there and hold that up. Or you will die. And so they will use that. So the mercy seat, which formed the top of the ark, is considered a separate piece of furniture. Now verse 14, a rather long section, they'll have a long discussion about it. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the side of the ark, that the ark may be born with them. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubics and a half shall be the length thereof, and the cubic and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold. Of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. Now God says, And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. They look down on the mercy seat. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee. And I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat between the two cherubims. Which are upon the ark of the testimony. Of all which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Now the ark was a chest as you see over here. And it's not a big chest, and it's covered inside and out with pure gold. It was made of shite of wood, which was more or less indestructible. It's much like a California redwood. It's a very good wood. And it's a perfect symbol, by the way, of Jesus Christ in his deity and his humanity. Everything, every piece of furniture, everything about the tabernacle tells us about Jesus. Even the way the furniture is laid out. Maybe you haven't noticed it yet. You go through the gate in a straight line. There is the altar. There is the labor. Going right into the holy place, the, burnt, you know, the offering of burnt incense, and the Ark of the Covenant to the two sides, right across from each other. The showbread and the uh, candlestick. What does it make? A cross. God does not have accidents. It's a perfect cross. He demonstrated even then, before crucifixion was even invented, just as we read in Scripture, something is going to happen. So it is a perfect example of Jesus Christ, the God-man. His deity was represented, of course, by the gold. His humanity is represented by the wood. The ark could not be spoken of as merely a wooden chest because it was also a gold chest. And it couldn't be called a golden chest. Why? Because it had wood. It was a chest of wood too. It required both gold and wood to maintain the symbolism of our Lord Jesus Christ who was totally man and totally God. There's no mingling of the two. There's two separate pictures here to overlook the duality 
is to entertain a, a really a, a bad notion of the person of Jesus Christ. There's no doctrine in Scripture so filled with infinite mercy and so removed from the realm of explanation as the union of Jesus Christ, totally man and totally God. It's hard for us to fathom. It is, you know, we, we accept it. We know it's true, but it, isn't it hard to understand the God of all creation taking on flesh, bone like we have? You know, no simple, there's no uh, other symbol that's so simple as the ark to describe the union between God and man in one body. It's a perfect picture. A mere box of wood or, and gold speaks of unfathomable things. Truly God chose the simple things to confound the wise. It is so amazing to me, these simple things that God chose, the most intelligent, educated people pushed them aside. And then there's folks like us who are not so you know, educated, we, kind of see, we see it. And that's the way God works. You have to kind of put away the things of the world. Open your heart and see the truth. You know, that simple box tells the whole story as far as we can take it in anyway of the unsearchable mystery of the blessed person of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the ark was covered inside and out with gold. Colossians 2, 9 tells us, For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus Christ was not merely a wonder worker. He was not just a miracle worker. He wasn't just a preacher going up and down the roads. He was more than that. He wasn't a man who had an overdeveloped conscience of God. You know, we live in a world, I guess for the last 2,000 years, people have had, oh, I've had this special meeting with God. I've done, there's nothing special like that. He is more than that type of person. He is God. Notice I didn't say he was God. He is God. Never use the past tense. Even when you're describing something that happened all those thousands of years ago, he is God. He was God then. He's God today. He's going to be God a million years from now. He's God. Jesus spoke as God. He put himself on the same plane as God. John 14, 1 and later in 14, 9, he says, let your heart not... Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. Then he talks to old Philip. He says, I've been so long with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip. He that has seen me has seen the Father. Don't let anybody ever tell you Jesus did not say he was God. Every time he said, I am, he was telling people I'm God. And the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and the priests, they knew it. They knew what he was saying. Yes, Jesus is God. And Jesus was also the perfect man, and he was totally man. He grew tired. He sat down to rest at a well of Samaria in the heat of the day. He slept, he ate, he drank, he laughed, he wept. And beyond all that, he suffered and died. All these things are human characteristics. And because of all these things, we can, He can identify with us. He knows what it's like to hurt. He knows what it's like to be hungry and thirsty. and have, he, he knows what it's like to have people hate, hate you. You see, the gold and wood and the ark are both required, yet neither was mingled with the other, nor is the identity of one lost in the other. Christ was both God and He was man. But two natures were never fused or merged together. He never functioned at the same time as both God and man. You say, well, he, he performed a miracle. He was God at that time. He's, he was performing as God. He never, never gave up being God, by the way. He was always God. He just gave up the glory that he had in heaven. But he was totally man and totally God. He was, what he did was either perfectly human, and I mean absolutely perfect, or perfectly divine. Now, and the ark was not to be an empty box. 
it contained three items that are told to us over in Hebrews 9.4, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant laid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. The contents of the ark are important, but they're also symbolic. Aaron's rod that budded naturally speaks of what? The resurrection. Manna speaks of the fact that Christ is the bread of life. The Ten Commandments speaks of the life that He lived. While here on earth, He fulfilled the law, all the points of the law. He fulfilled prophecy that was spoken of Him. He was perfect without sin. The tables of the covenant speak of the kingship of Christ. Jesus was born a king. He was. No one came and bowed down to him at the other royalty. Just some shepherds. Later on, some wise men came to the house. But Caesar didn't come. Pilate didn't come. No one came like that, but he was a king. He lived a king. He died a king. He rose from the dead a king, and he's coming to earth again as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You know, God's program is moving today forward, and it's been moving from eternity past to the point where Christ is going to rule the earth. And I'll tell you what, the earth needs a ruler. Man needs a king. Someday he is coming as King of kings and Lord of lords. Now that pot of manna speaks of Christ as a prophet. Sometimes people miss the fact that he was a prophet, priest, and king. He spoke for God in John 6.32. It shows, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Jesus Christ was also God's message to man. He is the Lagos, Greek for word. He is the word, the word of God. He is the very alphabet of God. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's God's final message to man. Did you know that? You ever think about it? That's it, it's the final message, Jesus Christ. Since Christ came to earth as totally God and totally man, heaven's been silent because God has no addendum to place after Christ. The entire Old Testament, the tabernacle, all the furnishings, all the sacrifices point to Jesus Christ. We're told how He lived. We're told how He died and resurrected. We're told how the church grew. But God's, Jesus Christ is the end there, isn't it? Silent years. There's nothing more to be said. There's no addition. God has told us everything we need to know. God told out his heart in Jesus Christ. You know, Aaron's rod that budded, by the way, it also speaks of the work of Christ as priest. The prophet spoke for God before man. The priest spoke for man before God. As priest, Christ offered himself. As priest, he passed into heaven. Even now he sits at the right hand of the Father. Jesus Christ, totally man, totally God, was raised from the dead. And He's the unique example of the resurrection up to the present hour. I'm going to tell you something. Easter lilies, eggs, Easter basket, Easter bunny, they don't speak of resurrection. Have nothing to do with it whatsoever. Aaron's rod that budded does. It was an old dead stick that came to life. Well, what, else, what, what a beautiful picture. The ark speaks of Christ as prophet, priest, and king. John 1, 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And that mercy seat rested on top of the ark. It served as the top of the chest, served as the top of the ark, and it was a separate piece of wood. It's made of pure gold with cherubim on each end with its wings spread, overlooking it, making a canopy over it, looking down at the spot 
where the blood was to be placed. It was there that the high priest would sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice. As I said, for himself and for the sins of the nation. It was the blood that make, made it the mercy seat. It's symbolic of Christ too, isn't it? Of the work of Christ. Christ literally presented His blood in heaven after His death on the cross. I know there are many people who say, well, that's crude. You know, I don't know why people have such a hard time with the blood, but people say that. Well, I don't believe it's crude because the blood of Christ isn't crude. It's precious. How do I know? Well, one of the most unlikely people in the world say so. Peter, over in 1 Peter 1.18, calls the blood of the Savior precious. I can't imagine. Peter's the one person I would think would say something like that. But listen, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. That old fisherman just doesn't seem like the kind of person to say, his blood's precious. But that's what he says. There's nothing crude about it. Christ's blood is more precious than silver and gold. After all, what can silver and gold get you? A few dollars? Won't get you into heaven. Won't save your soul. But the blood of Christ will. The most valuable thing in heaven is the blood Jesus Christ shed for man here on earth. He presented His blood and He entered into heaven. And that is what God's throne is. That's what that mercy seat is. That's where we find mercy today in Jesus Christ. You know, we're bidden to come to God on the basis of the fact that Jesus Christ, our great high priest, offered His own blood for our sins. He didn't slay a, a, a lamb, a heifer. It's His own blood. Hebrews 4, beginning at verse 14, reminds us, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us there come, therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. You know, we approach God through our great high priest, Jesus Christ. The difference is we don't have to wait until the Day of Atonement for that. We can go any time, any hour of the day, any day of the week. We can go to the Father through our high priest, the Son. He is the living Christ at God's right hand. Through Him we find mercy and we find help. A lot of believers are still trying to fight the battle down here. And they're trying to do it all alone. You can't do it. You're going to lose every time. They're trying to meet the issues of life alone. We're not able to do that. I don't care how strong you are spiritually, how educated you are in the Word of God, you can't do it. We're not strong enough. We need help. And we're not availing ourselves to the help that Christ offers us. You know, Paul prayed for the Ephesians that they might, that the mighty power that worked in Christ and bringing him from the dead might work with them. Over in Ephesians, Ephesians is a wonderful book, 1 19 and 20. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power? which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in heavenly places. See, we have very little power that's working in believers today. We need to lay hold of it by faith because we have a high priest who's sitting at God's right hand. But what else do we need? You know, the high priest who served in the tabernacle, he rushed into the holy place. They tied a rope around his waist. They put a little bell on him. If that bell stopped ringing, they'd wait a little bit. They couldn't go get him. If he died in there, they pulled him out by a rope. They couldn't enter. He sprinkled that blood on that mercy seat and he rushed out again. He didn't linger. 
that you know, Christ our high priest, completely different. When he made his offering, he sat down at God's right hand and he's still there for us today. No rush in, rush out. He is still there making intercession for us even right now. He died down here to save us. He lives in heaven to keep us saved. And we should keep in contact with Him. We keep in contact with everybody else. People's cell phones are running all the time. Aren't you? And God still answers email. email. Hey, you need to talk to Him today. So now we've looked at the Oracle of Furniture and the Holy of Holies, the Ark and the Mercy Seat. Next week, we'll take, starting to take a look at the Table of Showbread. But if I start that, we'll run late, so we will stop there this evening.